those crows are uh, they're gonna give us some atmosphere Mark Bury holds a master's degree in journalism, a doctorate in Canadian history, and a Juris Doctor degree. What's a Juris Doctor degree? It's a law degree. It's a degree that um, it's the old LLB, but they parted it up because the Americans started calling them Juris Doctors. So, but I'm, a, I'm a licensed lawyer, so yeah, I need that degree to practice law. It's what the old LLB has been turned into, you know. So you are the author of 13 previous books, among them McLean's bestseller, The Fog of War, and uh, Kill the Messenger, Stephen Harper's Assault on Your Right to Know. He has been a staff reporter for the Hamilton Spectator, London Free Press, and has contributed more than a thousand articles to the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star, and has written for the National Post and the Ottawa Citizen and other papers. He is the winner of a National Magazine Award in 1999 and several honorable mentions. We are here today to talk about his biography of Pierre Esprit Radisson, Bushrunner, the 2020 winner of the RBC Taylor Prize. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Me. Turning to the acknowledgments at the back of the book, you mentioned a friend and editor, Janice Zaborny. Yeah, Janice is one of the best editors in Canada. She's, a, she's an amazing person who has been working as a book editor for God, well over 20 years now. She was the person who kept this project alive all the way through. This was originally proposed well over 15 years ago. She liked it, but she couldn't really get it through the publishing board to the places that she worked at until she went, went to work for Biblioisis, which is a very innovative little publisher, a really nice, dynamic, Canadian-owned independent that is in the business of putting out really good books to sell to people. It's not a grant mill. It's not somebody's vanity project. It's a for-real publishing company owned by a person who, who knows books and really enjoys them. So why is Janice so good? Because she can spot a good project. She's very smart. Uh, she's very easy to work with. But working with Janice, I mean, it's just back and forth, very collegial. That's what you value most? I value somebody who doesn't decide to take the book on as their project and decide that they're the person who's competent to write it. Uh, I want to work with editors who basically let me write my book and then do the necessary tweaks where I where I make like small glitches and stuff. So if there's a structural problem that they catch, I'm all grateful. If there's a problem where um, I've used the same phrase, sometimes you get a little phrase stuck in your mind that sounds so good that you, you end up using it. Yep. Or a few pages. Janice and the editor I've had before that, Patrick Crean, who, I mean, Patrick Crean is a god in Canadian publishing. Yep. He really is. They both were so deft and so kind and uh, professional. And then I've also worked with some pretty good copy editors who go through and find incredible mistakes. Pierre Radisson was buried in St. Clement's Dane Church uh, on the Strand in London. And for some reason, when I typed it, I typed St. Clair Dane <laughs> okay. and sent it off. Now, I don't know whether I had just seen a Stardust movie again or whatever with Claire Danes, but I, I, I just had that in my head and I typed it down and when I got the uh, copy edited manuscript back I went oh my god you know, editors of all kinds copy editors star show editors can really help cover up a lot of sins I mean there are books out there who written basically, that have basically been written by their editors I'm not talking about ghost written books I'm talking about books that, that people wrote themselves and then by the time the book came out they, the editor had actually done a lot of rewriting and saved the project and uh, so sorry for authors in that situation, whether they, whether they went in too deep over their head or they just didn't string the words together well, or um, sometimes the project just gets away from you. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And, and, I, and I know of projects that have been fixed like that. I've seen a lot of other books be made in the course of my life, and it's an interesting process and very different for, for different kinds of books. Yeah. Like the process for a, a, a fiction book is considerably different because you are dealing with characters that can be changed, scenes that can be changed, sure. or plot that can be changed. We can't really mess with Radisson's like plot line 
too much or the characters too much. It's a matter then of uh, how much weight or space do you give certain things, certain aspects right. of this life. Yeah, you know? change your, your emphasis or you leave stuff out. That's basically it. Yeah, or you just stop. And most people who've written about Radisson tend to stop at the point where he joins the Hudson, joins the British, and they start the Hudson Bay Company, right? Without really digging deep into into what happened there, yeah. And except for a whole bunch of old textbook myths, like the idea that he went to the British because the French treated him so badly, which wasn't at all true. And then they just forget the rest of his life as if it didn't happen. Or that what happened after he went to England was really <laughs> astounding, and. Uh, and he didn't just join the English and stay with them. He actually flipped back and forth a number of times and ended up stranded in the Caribbean. I definitely want to get into his life. I just want to talk a bit about the genesis of the book first. Well, getting back to what I was trying to say, there was a, I chose to, to really flesh out uh, the other characters that he came across in England and put him into these times much more carefully than I think anybody else has ever done. Well, Samuel Pepys makes an appearance. Everybody makes an appearance. All the people you want to have dinner with in North America, in Eastern North America, and in England, and, and actually in France, too, at the time, they all show up. And I don't think it would disappoint anybody who studies British history at this period or, or the history of France, uh, you know, Louis the Fourteenth on, to come across people like Colbert, uh, come across Louis himself, come across Destre, the, the admiral who sailed his fleet of the rocks. All of the people who are connected with uh, with the Restoration, the Albemarle, people like John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, Prince Rupert. He's an amazing character, he is. An amazing character, and you know, there's a really good book written about him by Charles Spencer, Earl Spencer. We communicated with each other, that's one of the people I actually think in the back of the book, because he wrote a biography of Rupert. They kind of screwed up the Radisson story a bit, but the, the Rupert story was a real eye-opener. When he sent me a copy of that book and I read the thing through, I was like, Oh my God! This this guy's this guy's just a fabulous character. He's a mad scientist. He's, he's so friggin' ferocious and ruthless. Got this intellectual side. What he's a inventor, person. wasn't he? Yeah. What what a person for a guy like Radisson to come up and meet, and and not just meet him, but they you know they they worked on this project together with a lot a lot of other people who had been through real adventures themselves. It's not surprising so, that they got along well together. They both were hugely adventurous, right? Right, and so was the king, a real swashbuckler himself, who'd seen some pretty hard times. He'd, he'd only been restored to the throne six years before, and he'd been basically a fugitive for, for years, or a refugee hanging around, you know, caging meals at the courts of his relatives. And it was never a guarantee that he'd get back on the throne of England. And all these other people who are in the story, who are the aristocrats, were former soldiers in the Civil War that was absolutely brutal. And that's one of the things I wanted to explain in the book was that the, the portrayal of Europe that we get at the time of colonization is this sort of settled society coming over to exploit an unsettled society, which is the indigenous people. And my take on it is that the European society was in this incredible state of revolution. And the indigenous societies, which had been solid, were, were sort of knocked back on their own heels uh, by collisions with this basic mess of a society in, in Europe. And each side was trying to figure out ways of exploiting that situation with considerable success sometimes, but also with really disastrous consequences. You compare uh, Radisson to Forrest Gump. When he shows up in London, he shows up when the plague is hitting. He's there when the, when the great fire hits. So he's yeah. on this, this Caribbean expedition with the French that cost them an entire... Of naval fleet. He's in these courts, the court of um, Charles I of England, uh, Charles II of England, and uh, Louis XIV of France. Incredible characters, but he's also in, in New France. People don't realize, I don't think, at the very beginning, actually the first hundred years of New France, how very tenuous that colony was. There was like a little company town. There wasn't a lot of farming, it wasn't an agricultural society at all. But a bunch of people holed up in small communities, trading inland, uh, with most of the work being done by indigenous people. And Radisson is there when there's only a few hundred people of the entire colony. And there are times when, especially in 1660, when Radisson is coming back with his furs from his trip to the Lake Superior country, a serious consideration among the French to either pull out of uh, New France, just walk away from it, or sell it to the British or the Dutch or somebody. And that sort of thing happened all the time, actually. These colonies did trade and change hands. The Danes sold their colony in New Jersey 
mm-hmm. the Swedes, pardon me, the Dutch, the Dutch gave up their colony in New York and New Jersey to the Brits as part of a deal. Well, and Louisiana, of course, was sold too. Well, that was a bit later on, but still. That was later on, but yeah, and, and the Spanish were given and, and, and uh, gave up colonies in North America and settlement. Uh, the French had tried to settle down in Florida. These things were always in place, so we, we think, well, they would never have walked away from Quebec and Montreal, but they would have. They were, they were, they were little hole-in-the-wall villages, and all they were doing was collecting felt for the for the hat trade. It's a pretty marginal thing. It's only later in the 1600s when the... French government starts to get them growing hemp and timber for ships that, that the, the colony has any sort of military strategic value whatsoever. It's mostly there for the, for the fur trade and to be a pain in the ass to anybody else in the, in the area. Just let's get back to Janice for a minute. You value the fact that she doesn't really take over the project. You value the fact that she lets you write the book. Were there any uh, examples in this book where she worked on the structure for you or came up with some suggestions that you thought really were very helpful? Structure, no. Lots of suggestions. You know, it's been it's been three years since I was sure. acting and writing it, so yeah. boy. Not not the, not offhand. You know, a lot of times it's like me running something by her and saying, does this work? I remember at one point there was a lot of pressure from Janice to you know, sort of get more about Radisson's Quebec childhood. So this is, I think most people who listen to this haven't read the book. So Radisson is actually dumped in North America when he's a, a tween, uh, probably around 13 or so, or 14. And we don't know for sure anything about him except that it's possible that he was born in Avignon, but he might have been born in Paris. And we know that he can read and write. And we know that he really didn't have much of a bond with his parents. None. None at all. That whatever happened with the parents did not leave him uh, homesick for them. Because he's back in France. Let me do the math here. I always end up having to do this. He's back in France about three years after he shipped out. And he doesn't even try to go see them. Because he, he's, he's dumped in, in Trois-Rivières with his half-sister, who's running the store there. Grabbed by the Mohawks fairly soon afterward, yeah. uh, taken to the Mohawk country, spends maybe a year and a half, two years in the Mohawk country. No, a year and a half in the Mohawk country. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's about three years he's back in France. Okay. And, and he can't wait to leave okay. to go back to New France. Let's, <laughs> sorry so, to, so anyway, I, I, let's I get back to, to we'll get back to Janice then, so it's been a while though, so what about, what about, so the book, you, you were happy with the book, you were happy with your experience with her, what role did Dan play and why is he so good? He let me write a, a, a history book in a way that I don't think anybody's written, uh, a history of um, a Canadian figure. Why hasn't anyone written it like you have? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I, I think there's some structural problems in the way that Canadian history is written. Uh, I started glib a moment ago. Okay. I can walk you through this. Academic historians do not write my like books like this because there is no payoff for academics who write books that are meant to be written. So when you have major historians working at museums writing uh, accessible military history books uh, who can't get an academic job interview because people read their books, you know there's a problem in this country with the way history is being written. If you sell books, you are looked on as, uh, as a sort of sellout or somebody who's just the, sort of not the right kind of person in the Canadian historical firmament. Selling, you know, 20 or 30,000 of these books and winning the Charles Taylor Award does not give me any credibility, any more credibility with Canadian historians than I had what I had if I'd sold 50 copies of this book, which is about what an academic book in Canada sells these days, between you, 50 and 100 copies of a book. You've got the same credibility, and I think it's a lot of credibility, as Pierre Burton had. Oh yeah, the difference between Pierre Burton and me is I have a PhD in history, and that's one of the shields that I have to protect myself sure. from people yeah. who say that I'm just a journalist. Yeah. And um, who would love to be able to say, well, you're not qualified or credible to talk about this. My historical scholarship is as good as any pros, not just in terms of like the degrees that I have, but also my publication record. Well, I think a lot of it is about a lack of respect on the part of the academics for anyone who isn't an academic. I think there's a lot of disrespect on 
of readers in general. There's this idea that history is something that belongs to academia. You know, I heard John Ralston Saul talk about this one time, uh, and it, it really hit home, was that the history of Canada is not the property of the faculties of history in universities, it's the property of the people of Canada. And the people of Canada pay academic historians to be the custodians of this history, not the gatekeepers of it, not the deciders of what is history and what is not history. And I, I do take that to heart when, when I write something about someone like Radisson. I know that I have this responsibility, not just to the person I'm writing about, but to my readers and to the people in general, to make sure that the history I write is accurate and I'm not just making stuff up for some sort of political reason or to fit some kind of, you know, temporary zeitgeist. You've got to respect the facts, but you also have to respect what entertainment is. That's part of it, but you, you, you don't have to write in language that excludes the reader. There's a lot of attempts by uh, social science scientists now and, and humanities writers to develop scientific-style jargon that excludes uh, the very people who history is meant to educate, which is the mass of the people, not just the historians. The other and, thing, too, is, it, as you say, it's like you have to write in such a way as to hold the attention of the reader, number one, but number two... The academics don't have this necessity of selling the books, do they? Actually, it's better for them if they don't sell the books. The thing is to get, get the book published, to shoehorn his historical facts and historical topics into modern, what they would call timely things, which are often quite not timely, I've found, and to fit agendas of today. And there are agendas on the left and agendas on the right. Sometimes there's the agenda of the university itself. So you are, are you at war with academia? No, I, I mean, I just don't care about academia anymore. I mean, I've done it. I've been in it. Uh, I spent an awful lot of time as a, as a graduate student and as a law student. i um, seen an awful lot of it up close. I, I've taught. I'm not at war with it because it's not important. The things I would go to war with were, would be someone who would write a book saying you know, racist crap about the people who Radisson live with in the indigenous communities or and who, who gets criticized in the book and whose arguments I take on. I'm not taking on the arguments of some you know leather-patched elbow guy who's, who's joining on in a lecture hall in, in Peterborough, Ontario at some university that nobody ever heard of. I'm taking on people like Flanagan and Conrad Black who say that First Nations were nations and Indians, with air quotes, uh, were people who just basically grubbed around barely surviving until white people came along and told them how to live properly. That's the stuff that I want to tackle, not uh, get into some windy argument in, a, in an academic journal that nobody reads and only the only reason anybody writes for it is to get another line on a, on a CV. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite clear that you believe that the indigenous people at the time had sophisticated culture. Absolutely. The only way sure. you can argue that they didn't is to be deliberately ignorant and to, to make sure you don't actually learn the facts about those cultures. They are sophisticated in ways that we may never understand because of the way uh, they were documented and recorded. But, but Radisson is one of the few people who actually goes into it with an open mind. And he's one of the, that's one of the reasons I wanted to write this book. Well, he also learns their languages, doesn't he? That helps a lot. Now, the Jesuits learn their languages, too. Uh, someone like Jean de Brebeuf, who was a, a, a missionary among the Huron for well, 25 years before he got killed, deservedly, quite frankly. They, they learn the language, too, but when, what they did was they went around to, into the Huron culture, Ir yeah. who, who were the Iroquois group of people, and, and just judged it harshly. Every, everything they could find to... Uh, to compare it in negatively to European culture, uh, Ray Buff and the other uh, Huron-speaking Jesuits would do that. Uh, Champlain is very judgmental about the indigenous people, and Sagard, who was another writer about them, Le Caron, who wrote about them. These are all priests except for Champlain. Uh, Hannepin, who was a riot jury. But they're all, um, they all come at it from the point of view that these are people who... Um, we, well, okay, their point of view is we need to raise money from the rich of Paris, which is what most of the writing was for, so that we can run missions to save these wretched people. That's their point of view. So yeah. that's their propaganda. Well, Radisson, there's, and they consider themselves to be superior. Even if they didn't, they still, they're still fundraising. 
when you read the Jesuit relations, they're actually like sort of they break the third wall, and they say, "You, you ladies of Paris, we need money." Yeah, uh, Radisson's not asking for any money to convert anybody, no, or or start a colony or any of that kind of stuff. He just writes these two long pieces to tell a story quite privately, he thought, to two different British kings. And, and that's the core of his writing. And then there's a bunch of letters and stuff. There's no reason, even if he wanted to, and I don't think he did, to trash these cultures. He just says, this is what I saw. This is what happened. I think he, was, he respects them. Thing. Well, yeah, he, he was actually, he goes, he loved them. He's a member of a family of Mohawk, well, in the Mohawk country. He's adopted into this family. And he, he considers himself, as you read through his stuff or he reads in my book, he considers himself a part of that family even when he flees the Mohawk country. So he, he sadly abandons the family, but he, he, he fearfully abandons the Mohawks. There's two things that happen at the same time. Later on, he comes across Mohawks who know his family. And he asks about the family. He gives stuff to bring back to his, his mother and his father. And those are the only people he ever described as mother and father in any of his writings, by the way. And he's, uh, he's part of a, of, of a clan, and he maintains that clan membership all the way through his life. He, he pulls that out when he's in the, in the Lake Superior country and when he's up on the shore of Hudson Bay. These are all really important to him and not just as tools of a trade. I think that that's one of the few times that he felt any belonging. It sounds to me like when you chose him as a subject, you wanted to smash some myths, clarify the record. Would you say that was your primary motivation? That is to tell a good story. I, I, I didn't know the whole story of Radisson when I started working on the project. The last good uh, biography that was around when I started working on this was uh, written in 1932. I mean, it's, it's a pretty good book, but not as good as mine. <laughs> There's the, the business of, of, of him um, and his, his interaction with Native people, and I thought that was important to tell that story. Yeah. But also, it was important to tell a whole bunch of other stories, because the other big part of this book is, is, is a man who's in the, in the middle of the founding of capitalism. He is there when... Capitalism as we know it starts to happen. And we see him as, as, as part of that. Driven by um, the Dutch, as you say. By the, and the Hudson Bay Company. And, and he things happen to him that we can recognize really easily. And one of the things is that he, he, he's always called co-founder of the Hudson Bay Company, but he didn't own any of it. No, he gets shafted. Well, yeah. And, and, and so one of the first things that happened to the first years of capitalism is a guy who, who comes up with the idea, does most of the work, and gets screwed in the end. Yeah. And forgot, literally forgotten it, and the new guys that have come in, they don't know them, they don't give a damn about them. That's uh, called capitalism, right? That's it, and I think a lot of people get a bit of a, a chuckle out of that, that this guy, you know, got the same kind of crappy treatment so many of us have had in our workplaces <laughs> over time. Then they try to screw him financially, and he ends up suing them, you know? And they don't tell you that in, in high school, that, that Radisson had to sue these guys to get his, his pension, and that they didn't have any use for him anymore when he got, got old. They basically chucked him out. I think a lot of people of my generation under, understand what happened there. Uh, and this whole idea of people coming in the door as new managers and just not really caring about people as they take over a business, I think that, that might sort of resonate with people too. So there's a lot of a, a lot of stuff in, in the sort of English European side of the story that, that I really like. Yeah. And the whole business with the, his expeditions he went on and, and as he as he gets in the middle age just you see him trying harder and harder to you know, to work and to fit in and to be of value and to make a living and um, he has to play all these angles. And he, he lives to be quite old too, which is unusual yeah. for the night. Seventy four, seventy five. Yeah, and, he, and and by by rights he should have died years and years before. Like this is a guy who had incredible survival luck. Uh, just just all the trips he made across the Atlantic. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things that really stands out for me is how lucky how lucky he was. But let me just paint a quick little picture from some of the some of the sentences you've used throughout the book to describe him. Okay. Okay. He was an explorer who never discovered anything. He was no hero. He was a hustler. He had no scruples. He was a hardware salesman with uh, fascinating customers. He was ambitious, lived when he was with the indigenous people in a meritocracy, which helped him. And ultimately, in England, 
he ended up not being able to escape the class that he was born into. Yeah, I stick by that, all that. It doesn't mean he was like a person you wouldn't want to know. He, he was a raconteur, a of, right? Yeah, he gets a lot of credit and a lot of blame uh, for different things because people want to simplify him from a human being into some sort of stereotype or even a cartoon character, which is what we do with a lot of people in history. He's somebody who doesn't just have one story. He bounces around. He, he, he gets knocked down. He gets back up. The, the tenacity of this guy is one of the things that's very, very appealing. He just won't times, quit. Yeah, a lot of times people just say, screw it. I'm not, I, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go get a job. You know, I have a little money now. Maybe I'll go get a farm or something. Which he, There were times when he could have done that. He could read and write. There was lots and lots of work for people who could read and write. You know, and he just kept on doing these adventures instead. It took a lot. You know, a lot of juice to keep this guy going. He needed the adrenaline, you think? Yeah, you know, it certainly would have been easy to have missed out on all of the things that he got himself into. I mean, there were times that, that external forces, like being grabbed by pirates and off the coast of Africa and stuff, and he didn't have any choice in that. But he, there were times when he could just uh, stop. He would have lots of good reason to just say, well, okay, I've, you know, I've done this stuff. I had this adventurous life. You know, I think I'll open a a coffee house or a, you know <laughs> yeah but he but mark he was also a cannibal and a murderer yeah well uh, most people were at that time you know that uh, a mob ate the dutch prime minister at about the same time that radisson was around so we we just have different views on things like cannibalism and homicide he was a killer at a time when everybody was killing everybody it, it was a very very common to, to be a, a real sort of astounding murderer, you really had to work at it to be notorious in those days. Uh, a servant poisoning their master would be a, a good one that would be not notorious, or, or the Countess of Hungary who like killed a hundred children. But a guy like Radisson, I mean, he, he did kill people, but uh, you know, usually war, he murdered a dog. That that really bothered me. He ate people. Once he ate somebody, he ate the dog too. He ate every speck of that dog. Every speck, it was not a speck of that dog went to waste. Uh, he, he ate the bark before it was over. Did he eat um, the uh, Did he eat the hair of the dog as well? I'm sure he did. The next morning, he, when he murdered a dog when they were starving, they they gathered up the bloody snow and they boiled that too. That's right. Um, yes. Yeah. And uh, you know what? What was a ritualistic cannibal experience? And one was uh, uh, an experience where he was on a war party and they ran out of food and they had a prisoner. But the, the thing with Radisson and the cannibalism is, you know, it's shocking to us that people did that, but it wasn't. It was, at the time, absolutely what was done. But the thing was that the, the beauty of the cannibal stories is that Radisson told them. And the fact that he actually wrote that down and gave it to King Charles II tells me that there's a lot of honesty in what he wrote. His, his writings were attacked because he, he was very sloppy, and I think he filled in some holes in terms of his travels. But I think the anecdotes, uh, by and large, are, are accurate. And the really intense stuff, I think the more intense it is, the more important it is, the more accurate it was with him. You actually call him a fabulous writer. Why is he a fabulous writer? I couldn't get enough of his writing. I really enjoyed them, his what's, writing. What's so good um, about it? He's, he's a good story. He was a good storyteller. His, his, his description of what happened... To him, um, especially the first writing, uh, which is in English, and, and again we get that that gets us back to his language. That is a great story. The detail that he puts into that, yeah. that he leads us. The fact that when he starts his little hunting trip as a kid, as, as basically a boy along the shore of the St. Lawrence, that he has a nosebleed when it starts. Yeah. He puts that little detail into it, which I used to start the book. Boy, that's just gold, you know? You know, in fact, that's that's really striking about your book, how granular the detail is, and I guess you must have gotten that from his work. Is that it? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I, it's not a novel. I didn't make it up. So when he talks about the big, the big salamander falling into the canoe and stuff, and then the squirrel falls in after the salamander, and then this mayhem going in the canoe, the fact that he thought that that was a story worth remembering and telling, to me, suggests a very interesting mind that is... That enjoys humor because there's a lot of humor to that story. Yeah, there's no danger or anything to it. It's just a it's just a funny little story that he wrote down. He, he had the time and the money to sit down and write the story, which which I'm so grateful for because Charles II paid him. Tell me these stories. I love these stories, and so sent him to Windsor Castle during the um, during the plague and had him write it all down. Um, there's just nothing like it in early Canadian literature. 
Uh, the, uh, Champlain comes close, but you know it's mostly I went here, I went there, I did this, I did that. A little bit about you know trashing the natives from time to time or whatnot. Radisson talks when he goes up the Ottawa River, and I, I boat on the Ottawa River. I know exactly where he is and what he's talking about. Uh, for people who know Ottawa at all, he talks about uh, fishing. Um, well, the, around the mouth of the Gatineau River, which yeah. where there are lots of. And, and walking behind the Rideau Falls, which was sort of a party trick that if you were traveling inland with indigenous people, yeah. that was one of the things they did with you. They went behind the Rideau Falls, just like, you know, it's sort of a thing you do with tourists, kind of, you know, when, you, when someone's in town, kind of thing. Champlain was behind there, too. You mentioned Germaine Workington, who, who pulled together his collected writings. Yeah, she did that for the Champlain Society a couple, a few years ago. Not a couple anymore, because it was a couple of years before I started the project. She's a uh, professor uh, at the University of Toronto. She might be retired now. I, I got to backtrack, but the Champlain Society puts out collections of primary source historical material. So, so there's a little bit of information, and they'll have a document and uh, oh, like a whole book of documents. So they've done stuff on the Black Donnelly. Yeah. And then have all of the all of the newspaper reports of the trials and all the stuff that happened, or they'll have all the correspondence of some you know. Canadian colonial official or, or whatever. More people should know about them, I think. Yeah, their books were always red. Now, this series was black. They were they were limited editions of like 500. Yeah. So I have quite a few of them. Um, some of them aren't that interesting. They've become more interesting, I think, in the last few years as, as they've looked at people like Radisson. So um, in Workington, uh, collected the two major documents plus the letters that Radisson wrote to a, a, a priest in France. That was really useful stuff to have that in one spot. The, the value added that Ms. Workington did with the project was that she annotated a lot of this material. She's footnoted through a lot of it uh, with explanatory material, which was great. You used her book. Did you go to check out original source documents? Yeah, uh, I have to go to archives because the, um, the two main Radisson pieces are actually on the internet. We're on the internet before they were in the Champlain Society material. What I did was I took those two and, and the letters. And then one other thing was the uh, Hudson Bay Company archives. Where's that? Uh, they were in London, but they're in Winnipeg now. Oh, good. And they're in the, 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 the uh, province of Manitoba runs so Thank God, because they could have so easily been lost. But they're just such a treasure. That's fantastic. Uh, what library are they in? They're in the uh, Manitoba Provincial Archives. And they, back in the 20s, they they actually had people working for the Hudson Bay Company uh, collecting important early documents and publishing them in very limited edition. I had to pay 500 bucks for one set of letters back and forth from Radisson to the Hudson Bay Company and the other early people in the Hudson Bay Company, which were in the Workington collection. So you got a copy of those that were published by the Hudson Bay Company years ago, is that it? I think they published like 200 copies of them or something. And then I also had tons and tons of academic papers on Radisson. Radisson has these sort of uh, ups and downs in terms of interest to scholars. So there was a period in the 18, late 1800s when they found the first Radisson writing. They were lost for a long, long time. So when that came out, that was about the time that the um, sort of Minneapolis area and, and, and Minnesota in general was being settled when farms were opening up and Minneapolis was being built. The 1880s, right? Yeah. And so Radisson's story comes along at a very fortuitous time because they're casting around for a founder. And this lands on Radisson's shoulders, even though he, he got into Minnesota, but barely. So he ends up as, as sort of the founder of Minnesota. And there were all of these amateur and professional historians of the time writing about Radisson. Grace Newt is one of them, right? Yes, she writes a book called Caesars of the, of the Wilderness, uh, um, which is a biography of Radisson and Grosilia. And, uh, and that's the one that was in 1932. That, that was the, the book that I was talking about, that, which is a pretty good biography of it and is impossible to get now, especially in first edition. I think it's about 400 bucks for one of those suckers, if you can find one. But there were other scholars, and they would get into the discussions of, you know, did he go to the Mississippi? Did he make two trips or just one trip? That sort of stuff was, was sort of all over the historical record, or publishing record. There were pieces by Canadian scholars about Adam Pillard, who has a, a sort of cameo appearance in this thing, but really pivotal, actually, to the history of Canada uh, and the history of Radisson, because he's the guy who fought, well, I think he, I think he attacked the Iroquois at the long suit in, in um, north of Ottawa and was killed. And Radisson came 
through right afterwards or soon afterwards. And this closed the fur trade on the Ottawa River for years. And that's why Radisson went to work for the English, not because of the way the French treated him. But there's a, you know, there's a lot of discussion about Dollard, who he was, what he was doing, where his fort was. And a lot of people would like to think it was in Quebec, but it's pretty obvious proof that it was actually on the Ontario side of the Ottawa River, which back in those days, there was no such concept anyway. It wasn't, it was, you know, basically uh, yeah. the Algonquin territory. You called the, the Ottawa River the superhighway of the 1600s. Yeah, that was the way inland. You didn't you didn't go in down the St. Lawrence and through Lake Ontario and the Great Lakes to go out west. You went up the Ottawa River to basically where Mattawa is in Ontario, uh, up the Mattawa River to Lake Nipissing, down the French River from Nipissing to Georgia Bay, and then you then you were in the on your way out west. Uh, shaved off many many miles of travel that way. Uh, you got away from the borderlands between the, uh, the five nations and and the. First Nations that were living on the what's now the Ontario side of the Great Lakes and basically the northern side of the Great Lakes tend to be fighting with the people on the southern side of the Great Lakes, so you didn't want to be around there for that. And when you when you're going out west through the St. Lawrence Lake Ontario Lake Erie system, you're actually going southwest. The the canoe route up the Ottawa took you to the northwest, and that's where the money was for the fur trade. He was adopted by the Iroquois. So tell me a bit about the culture of the Iro- Iroquois. Well, it's a very sophisticated culture that's still being written about and is still alive. It's not a dead culture, it's a, it's a very adaptive culture and an extremely entrepreneurial and thoughtful group of people. I can't stress that enough is that, is that Radisson describes it and other writers have described the amount of, of really serious thought that the Iroquois gave to things like diplomacy and government and warfare. Yep. And, and, and what you would do with war, uh, how you would use war, to things like land ownership, land tenure, women's roles, which are... Significant. Oh, extremely significant. It's a society that's both matriarchal and patriarchal in the sense yep. that women chose the chiefs. Uh, when male chiefs were deadlocked or when the issue was really serious, the women basically took over the decision. And we see that in Radisson's case, uh, we see the role of his mother his adoptive mother in his life. Yeah. Um, she's the one who's pulling the strings. Yeah. You know, she's the one who's, who gets things done, uh, who's, who decides that he's going to be adopted, who decides that uh, he's going to be saved when he really should have been executed, would have been executed for, for things he'd done um, among the Mohawk. If, he, if he'd been in a European country, he'd have been done uh, for what he did. And, well, you know, uh, one of the reasons that uh, that I think he was accepted, uh, you suggest, is that he was charismatic, he was brave, he was good-looking, uh, he was cheerful, eager to please, he was in good shape. Iroquois people believe that people who didn't learn their language quickly were just basically stupid and had no use for them. The fact that he had this God-given talent for languages is a real lifesaver for him. As you say, he, he embraced danger... <laughs> and loved adventure. I think most people would have just curled up and started crying for their mother. It's really emblematic of that when he's, when he's with them. He's only been with the Iroquois for a few hours, and he starts paddling the canoe that, that he's a prisoner in. He works so hard paddling that they show him how to do a better canoe stroke so that he's not working too hard. And he starts cooking for them and stuff, and it's, it's kind of clear that he's not doing that just so that they don't kill him. Because he doesn't ever seem to think that he was in danger of being killed. I, I, you know, there's just these big sort of blind spots in his, in, with him. You call um, him. You call him fearless. He, he is uh, fearless, and, and, and he's got some sort of trust that something really terrible isn't going to happen to him. And most people would, would, like you said, they'd curl up or they'd freeze. You know, they'd be so anxious that they try to to be useful, but would probably choke up. He just joins in. There's never a point where he gives up. No, it's interesting, though, isn't it, how he just betrays him and takes off. Everybody sort of seizes on that, but, you know, you try to explain that in the book, and I think I think this is what happened, was that when he finally got the chance to go to the Dutch post at Fort Orange, which is near Albany, New York State, he talks to a French guy in there who is a soldier, and the soldier tells him that the French are going to come and conquer the Iroquois, and if they find him there, he's a goner, that he's yeah. a traitor. I think he's actually afraid of the French government. There's probably something that's happened there. When he left France, there was basically an aborted revolution going on. There was a, a, well, actually a two-stage rebellion at the time that he left. And it's one of those forgotten ones because it didn't succeed. I just can't believe that there's no, that it's a coincidence that he shipped out at the time of the Fronde, which is these rebellions, right? He probably actually does believe that the government of France has incredible power. He's been told that all his life. He's seen all 
all kinds of like you know danger and death among the French. I think he believed he had good reason to, to not be there when the French came to to do in the war. About, it's self-preservation, then, really. Yeah, it would it would be another like 15 years before that actually happened. But when the French did send a military force to the Mohawk country, they did go in and devastate it uh, in the 1660s. Now, the Mohawk, they bounced back. Some of them actually went and started living alongside the French, but it, it was a real setback to the Mohawk. And had he been there at that time, maybe he would have been in that kind of trouble. I mean, it wasn't a totally unrealistic thing. No, it wasn't necessarily a betrayal. It was more of a... This is a pragmatic move. Yeah, it was in his mind an attempt to save his own life, and it's the reason that he gives uh, for leaving. And there's so many other reasons that he could have given that would have flown just as well with the people reading his stuff. If he said, I don't want to live among these people, I want to live among my own people, I didn't like the food, which is often a complaint of his um, everywhere he went. It's a lovely remark. You you say that his, his whole life is sort of defined by a... <laughs> a search for good food, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, he could have said all that kind of stuff about the Iroquois. Nobody would have batted an eye, but he's, he's, his reason he gives is I, I didn't want to be seen as a, as a traitor if, if the French ever came. So then he, uh, he actually comes back to them, and he has to endure some torture, and he shows bravery, which, so they sort of accept him back. Yeah, I think the deal was already done that he was going to be accepted, but they were just going to teach him a lesson. You know, the, the mother again, she that's the role she plays, is uh, she's behind the scenes when he when he screws up big time and and decide, and, and she she saves his, him using concepts of Iroquois law that that are fantastic, but alien to us. It, the, the Iroquois system for for uh, dealing with serious crime was to pay restitution from one large family group to another and an awful lot not not like a little gift or something we're talking like serious wealth and uh i'm positive this is what happened with radisson one of the things that you remark on in in uh, the iroquois society which i really didn't know and and was impressed with is the how they valued public generosity and despised miserliness Speaking of torture, you suggest that this torture right is the core of anti-Iroquois propaganda. Can you expand on that? It's something that the Jesuits used uh, to push their own missions and to uh, push for the sainthood of, of, the, of the priests that were killed in the, in the Beaver Wars. Now, depending on how you look at them, I mean, I count nine, but there's, what are there, seven that are actually canonized? Jesuits that were, that were killed in the in the sort of mid 1600s yeah. in, around the Great Lakes area the, the Catholic faith of the time and still is that the, the, the garden of the church is watered with the blood of martyrs people who are martyred for their faith are people who are definite candidates for sainthood so there were there were only two of the of the of the Jesuits that were actually tortured to death but these people were really special the torture itself was inflicted as, as an attack on the Catholic faith and then right. these are basically the most vicious, barbarous, horrible people going because they would do these kind of tortures on people. But while the Iroquois were killing priests, so were the English killing yeah. Jesuit priests. And, you know, at the time of the death of Brainbrook and Malamon, the two that were tortured to death, the Brits were hanging, drawing, and quartering Roman Catholic priests, Jesuits, anytime they got their hands on them. That meant hanging them, cutting them down, castrating them, burning their dangly parts in front of their eyes, ripping out their guts uh, while they were still alive, and then cutting off their heads and quartering them. So right. I'm not too sure that anybody can judge Iroquoian ritual torture without keeping that in mind. And the people back in the 1600s, they knew that, and we forgot it along the way. So that's one of the reasons you wrote the book. One of the reasons I wrote the book was Canadian history and the history of Indigenous people and the history of the interaction of European and Indigenous people is, has been written by Canadian historians in a silo where we only talk about what went on here. And by placing Radisson in the world of the European and the world of the Indigenous and in the world of Europe and in the world of America, then we can understand 
what what the forces were that were going on in the early colonization period, the trade period, which are two different things, which I try to make out very clearly in the book. The Radisson was not a colonizer. He was not in the business of starting a colony in North America. But how all of this stuff was going on at a time when the when the indigenous people had been backfitted by the, all the epidemics and the zoonotic diseases brought over, and Europe was being torn apart in religious wars. When all of this settles out, we begin to see the development of colonial Canada. We're well, speaking of, of uh, commerce. At this point, then, he teams up with his brother-in-law, in Grosselier. Here's how you paint him. He was stubborn, greedy, ruthless... Sneaky, treacherous, no social skills uh, or political instincts. Plus, he abandoned his wife and kids. What did he have? You know, you spend a lot of time with somebody in the bush. I think it was really good in the bush. Okay. Uh, I think he had the ability to travel. Now, that doesn't mean he was good among the indigenous people. He had a real habit of pissing them off, and dangerously so. But he, I think he was pretty good at traveling in the wilderness, which uh, would have been something that would have created a bond with Radisson. He was also the only European family, and very tangentially, um, that Radisson had the only male family member that, that, that's important to Radisson other than the adoptive people who he doesn't see again right. after he leaves the Iroquois country. Well, you know what's uh, interesting? He doesn't betray his brother-in-law throughout his whole life. No, but he does betray his brother-in-law's son. Oh, does he? Okay. Yeah, yeah, he does. The younger Grosselier gets betrayed by Radisson up in the Hudson Bay thing, which as far as the book people don't seem to read that often, but uh, that's a great story up there, what happens to those guys. Uh, and then I think the, the brother, the, the, the nephew eventually gets killed, um, but we're not sure what happened to, to him. He just disappears. Mm. But the old, the old, the old Grosselier goes back to the French. He doesn't stick around among the Brits. And he, he goes back to Trois-Rivières and smokes his pipe on the porch and just fades out of history, uh, leaving, leaving behind an awful lot of descendants who should buy the book. But he's, uh, he's a real foil for Radisson, a real character. He's the guy that everybody goes to when they try to sort of undermine the pair of them or come up with some dirty scheme. It's Radisson, it's Grosselier that the spies go to and the creeps go to. And it's Grosselier whose big mouth often gets them into an awful lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things uh, that you do is you give a nice sort of description about what's so important about the, the beaver hats and you compare the beaver hat to a kind of a sexy looking car today. That's basically the role that it played. Yeah, or a watch. I, I, I think I think as a matter of personal apparel, a, a watch or a, a tailor-made suit. A status because symbol. Everybody, yeah, everybody, everybody who, who had any aspersions to be uh, middle class, everybody wore a hat. So a tradesman would wear a cap or whatever. And, and if you had any sort of any inclination to pass yourself off as middle class or upper class, you had to have a beaver hat. They were really, really expensive. It's like an economic, it's an unsubtle economic signaling, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and, and you had to wear a hat uh, in certain places, in certain social situations, you literally had to wear a hat or you would be considered sort of naked. So let's say if you were going to the, the, the king's court, which is you know, basically like a sort of wide open meeting of everybody connected to the, to, to the government or whatever, or going to an office or going to a business meeting or whatever, or going to church. So you didn't wear the hat in church, but taking off the hat was as important, this is as important as wearing it. Like who you took it off for, who you tipped your hat for. It was a, and it's something that my grandfather would understand completely because he was born in 1908. The hats went out of style in the early 60s, and all of the associated rituals of, of hat wearing went out of style with the hat. I'm not saying all, all men don't wear hats, but the kind of gentleman's hat is long out of style now. And, and is only wear, worn sort of ironically when you know, people wear a top hat or whatever. But a, 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 a hat was as much a part of a, of a man's clothes as a jacket or whatever. And they were a status symbol, and they were. And they changed from time to time. The, the style them changed, so you had to get a new one. The main hat that you see you see pictures of, it's a dorky kind of wide brimmed looking thing. I, I I don't know who the hell would ever want to wear one of those today. Oh, they you know you think of the Three Musketeers. I mean that's that's the way they saw themselves wearing these hats. You know, swashbuckling, you know, wide brimmed hat. Uh, maybe with a feather or whatever, or a band. 
they get they get more formal where they're, they're sort of colon shaped with a smaller brim and they're uh, sort of more prissy looking uh, the kind of thing that a, a minister a Protestant minister would wear or a Puritan would wear or whatever but they were originally meant to look really sexy the Swedes brought them from the from the east during the, the Thirty Years War and they looked damn sharp <laughs> and okay. and uh, they changed over time and they there was no no other substitute for that felt. They, they, there was no way to make a really good hat like that without using beaver felt. That's right, because so, it, it it allowed for that wide brim, right? Yeah, you could make a cheap knockoff on a rabbit, but it would fall apart. Eventually, they got better at making rabbit. Once they started getting good at making rabbit, they started making the hat. The thing that's amazing, really, is that this was a, a fashion accessory, and yet it was a gigantic industry for Canada. It, it was such a huge boon, wasn't it? Yeah, well, because the beavers became very expensive. There was a real shortage of them. There was a lot of money in this business. I, I figure one of those hats, probably in today's money, would set you back maybe 5000 maybe more. 5000 yeah. bucks for a hat. Yeah. Holy shit. So when you talk about that kind of money, money is money. Uh, money always does what money does. And uh, when money gets around, people start doing stuff for it. Yeah. And so they'll go into the bush and you know risk their lives for lots and lots of money. People like Radisson and, and the young men that were employed by Champlain, like Etienne Brule, they made a ton of money. And they blew a ton of money. You make uh, the observation that he comes out from one of his first big trading expeditions with 140,000 pounds of beaver pelt. Yeah, I, I don't know how they spent that much money that they got off that. that is, so it, that's huge. The governor of Quebec taxed a lot of it. They always say that's why he left the French. But then I found out that he went to France, appealed it, and got all the money back. So that's not why they left. But Brasilia was, it was, had this swarm of people around him, right. like a crew that he was paying all this money to, they literally couldn't get rid of that cash fast enough. They should blow it in a couple of years. But you don't know what they spent it on? I think they spent it on everything they could spend it on. Everything except stuff that would last, it seems. And it was that easy come, easy go kind of money that really made these adventurers tick. And then they weren't the only ones who, who made big, big piles of dough like that. So you have these guys doing that in Canada. Then they, when they shipped the furs, they don't go to Europe. Well, they go to Russia. The um, process for getting the lint off the beavers, they don't do this in, in, in France or England. Only the Russians do it. Then they ship the lint to Europe where they make it into hats. So you can imagine you know, all these hands that yeah. the stuff goes to all get these the fur. Men, yeah. Somebody prepares it. Probably the, the trapper, who's often a woman, will prepare the, the pelt too. Then it's brought down all the way from the middle of the continent. This is before they started sailing into Hudson Bay, which is the brilliance of the Hudson Bay Company. Loaded on a ship, sent to Russia, then loaded, you know, then back to Europe. Somebody makes it in a felt, somebody else, a tailor makes it into a hat, and then the retailer sells it. Well, I mean, we're talking huge, huge markups and money flowing all through the system to everybody who's involved, right down to the people who are making the, the axe the axes and the knives and the fish hooks and stuff that are being traded to the indigenous people. Fascinating business. It really is. And, and you give a, a, a good, good description, very detailed description of, uh, of how it works. And uh, I love the fact you talk about in the wintertime, it's easier to get these pelts because they just go and, and crack open these beaver lodges. Yeah, haul them out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They leave the younger ones. Uh, the Cree would leave the younger ones because they had a pretty good sense of conservation and restocking. But I think when, when they got short, most of the people who trapped them would just go for all of them because it was just more of the cash. Well, not, well, the indigenous people, it wasn't really cash straight up, but it was bartered good. So why'd they go over to London? They just wanted to sell shares in a company? They figured they'd make money that way as well as just going out and getting the, the pelt? in Acadia. They couldn't get out west. They decided they'd go down to the American Northeast, basically to Massachusetts. And when they got to Boston, they made friends with these um, basically senior bureaucrats that were in Boston making a deal with the Dutch to take over New York. They went back to London with those guys. So they, they spent the winter talking with these guys about what they what Radisson knew of New York because they're trying to get a value of it, whether or not it was worth buying from, from the Dutch. 
Uh, buying, this was I, a chain in New York, not New York City. I don't understand. And, well, buying what? Well, the Dutch owned the entire state of New York and New Jersey. And these British commissioners were in Boston to negotiate with the Dutch to take over that colony. What's that got to do with our guy going over to London to try to set up the Hudson Bay Company? Well, if you read the book, you'd see that when he was in I Boston. I did. I did read the book. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, he goes to Boston at the same time those guys are there. Yeah. And he meets them. One of those guys, who's a commissioner, is shunned by Boston society because he's hooked up with a married woman. The only friend he makes is Radisson, and they, they scheme together, and they come up with this idea of trade. Radisson goes with the commissioners back to, to England, and those guys, these commissioners for the takeover of the Dutch colony, are his gateway into the British elite. And then he starts peddling this idea of the Hudson Bay Company. During the plague, that's when he gets there. He gets there during the plague, and then there's the fire. Did he ever meet Daniel Defoe? I don't know. He certainly met Samuel Pitts. I don't understand, though, because if he was making such good money just going out and getting these pelts and then selling them to whomever, why did he have to go over to England? to? Because it, it ends up that he gets shafted anyway. He makes more he makes more money going out directly himself and bringing this 140,000 pounds back in than he does yep. going to all the mess of going to London. The reason he does it is because the, the Iroquois with the killing of Dollard they close the Ottawa River. He can't get back out west again and, and do another trip like that. And he realizes that the only way to get into the middle of North America at that point with the Iroquois controlling the ways into the, up into the Great Lakes is to go in the back door through Hudson Bay. And the only way he can do that is with ships. The, the French don't want to do it. The French want to hang on and wait and see if they can get back up their roots with their with their trading buddies. And the Brits, the Brits are open to the idea. That's, yeah. that's why he does it. But this cockeyed idea that Hudson Bay and Lake Superior come really close to each other, so it, you can practically get right to where he'd been if you just sail in. He's off by about 400 miles. We won't get into it, but there's an amazing uh, adventure that you take us on down to the Caribbean. You do touch on the fact that he gets... It, there's, there's not much sex in the book, I must say. You can't make that up, right? So, uh, but he does get married, and it's interesting. She's got an overbearing father. I couldn't help but think of Ophelia. He marries Pirate's daughter, which, you know, talking about Shakespeare, that's the idea that they keep coming up with when Shakespeare loves the, something, Ethel, and the, Ethel the pirate's daughter. Well, he, his first wife was a pirate's daughter, and the pirate's a real bastard. And uh, I, I tries to control Radisson and, and his wife. He's a respectable pirate. All the pirates became respectable when the monarchy was restored. But they were all pirates ten years before Radisson met them. They're all vicious, vicious bastards. It, it ruins Radisson's marriage. Um, he's kind of fortunate in that his wife eventually dies. So he has a chance to, to have a marriage that works. But he, he's kept away from his wife by his father-in-law. Um, which yeah. is really astounding for that period of time, considering that when a man married a woman, he basically took over that property of the wife from the father. But the father, in this case, did not sign over the daughter. He's made a bit of a laughing stock over in France because you know, they figure he yeah. can't control his wife. Yeah, and, and you know, where, if you say you're going to come and live with us, where's your wife? If, yeah. if you were really planning to come here and stay, you would have brought your wife with you. And then when he says, well, my wife's staying behind because her father gives her this big fat allowance and she won't come with me or she'll lose it, they just think he's like a total loser. Yes, exactly, yeah. You mentioned the, the charter of the Hudson's Bay Company. Where's that? Good question. I don't know. I, don't, I think it's in England still. We should get that over here. Yeah, or maybe it still belongs to the company. It was issued to the company, whether they kept that uh, or whether it's... It's in the archives? I don't know. Let me look it up. I got my computer right here. Okay. I did a question I never asked myself. It's an incredible document. As soon as you said that in the book, I thought, i got to go see that. Yeah, it's it's not unique. There are other similar charters, but there are uh, very few that are still in business. The companies that have come and gone. It's a beautiful document. Let's see now. Our HBC Heritage. I should have put that in the book where it went. I'm going to call, I've got the Hudson Bay Company webpage right here. Oh, it's on sale right now at the Rio location. No. So they made two copies. 
The uh, original was housed at Rupert's house in Rupert's, uh, apartments in Windsor Castle. Two times they used it as collateral for loans, but they got it back. For a couple hundred years, it was in the committee room of its London office. 1920, it was in the main boardroom at Hudson's Bay House in London. During World War II, they packed it away so it wouldn't get bombed by the Germans, thank God. In 1980s, it was taken to Toronto, by the, I guess, by the Thompson family when they bought the company. Okay. It's under glass in the company's boardroom, and it's in the HBC corporate head office in Toronto. Excellent. So we can go check it out. Yes, we can. It doesn't say we can go check it out. It does not say you're invited to come see it. Now, they said they made two copies. I don't know what happened to the other one, but the, the real first copy is the one that they have. Not the big seal on it. Okay, so... That's bringing us back back to the present, and the present is not a happy place for the Hudson's Bay Company because it's owned by a freaking American hedge fund. Yeah, it stays are numbered. So what's your take on the fact that the Canadian government and Canadian people don't seem, didn't seem to give a shit when it was sold to an American company? This is our, one of the longest living companies in the world, and it's Canadian, and no one seemed to care. Well, what's the government going to do about that? Uh, make them fight a Canadian buyer when everybody in the world is dumping department stores in the teeth of Walmart and Target and Amazon and stuff? You know, it's too bad. It's too bad that the Thompson family sold it, but... I think the government of Canada can't go into the department store business. It no. shouldn't go into the department store business. It's just, it's just a bitch, you know. But all these companies are coming. God, there may be something that survives from it. Yeah, um, yeah. There may be something that. Well, that we've got go the on. archives, as you say. The archives are in Winnipeg. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's the score. And that's the thing that we, you know, that we would have had to go after if they had taken that stuff to the states. Yeah. With them that the government of Canada really w would have had to say, look, this is a cultural treasure and we need it. Definitely if uh, the Hudson Bay Company goes completely mams up and out of business, we want that charter. And we may have to pay for it. That's their property. I, I don't I don't think we'd be able to expropriate it even if we wanted to because they're in the States and they could just tell us to, no, no, we're not going to do it. Yeah. But yeah, we, we, I, we might have got off easy. I don't know what archives we've lost over the years in terms of we, we, you know one of the big archival losses was in 1916 when um, a lot of the documents of the French regime which were stored in the parliament building yeah, burnt, burnt, burnt right burnt. yeah burnt terrible thing that, that lost no copies made yeah you know no transcripts made uh, just like the sloppy lousy uh, record keeping that, that we've had in this country until you know, until like the 1920s, 1930s, when uh, Doty took over as Dominion Archivist. Canadian hero, he is. Yeah, and I'm trying to, I'm writing a biography of, of somebody who was involved in the Canadian corporate world in the 1930s, 1940s, early 50s. And there's less documentation of him than there is of Raz, because the corporations involved didn't bother to keep anything, and the family involved, well, there was a... a, a That's so often the case with corporations and families, there are spats. Yeah, I'm writing about newspapers, and newspapers are terrible at keeping records. Absolutely grim. Kind of ironic, uh, isn't it? It's terribly ironic, yeah. And they have no interest in all, at all in their own history, it's, uh, to speak of. I'm not, not every newspaper, but by and large, and these companies have changed hands so many times that there's no real emotional connection to the original product yeah. they sell. Sell the same paper, say the Globe and Mail, but the Globe and Mail's changed hands four times uh, yeah, yeah. since it was founded as, as the Globe and Mail. And before that, it changed the Globe and the Mail and Empire changed hands umpteen times before that. So, um, so we 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 are not good in this country with keeping records at all. Yeah, and uh, part of, it's part of the Canadian cheapness when it comes to history. We don't we like to talk about our history. We won't spend a dime on it. Well, that yeah, that's that's that goes for Canadian the Canadian general public who's too cheap to buy first editions, and it's also the government and it is big business. The business doesn't support the history and the arts in Canada like they do in the states. No, no, there's a the big problem with businesses uh, not not showing much use for that stuff. Governments are constantly 
worried that if they spend money on something that the media would consider a frill, uh, they're going to be pegged as, as wasteful and, you know, we got to balance the books and blah, blah, blah. But they don't realize the value. There's actual financial value in history. I mean, who would go to England without its history, right? Who would go to Rome without its history? We go, we go to these places and we want to see the things we've heard of. New York City, you walk through Manhattan and you just come from one thing to another, to another, to another you've heard of. And Canada, we're, we're blank. You know, you can go through the, a town or whatever, you might see a plaque. But we, we, we don't value the history of our, of our own country. Um, we treat our own history as if it's sort of second rate the way we treat Canadian movies or Canadian music, maybe not as much as we used to with Canadian music. It's, it's part of our national insecurity and our, and our inherent cheapness and in in, in this belief by many Canadians that we're sort of living in the attic of the United States and that really the stuff that's for real is, is there. The history never happened here. Yeah, and yet your book here is proof that a ton of fascinating history is taking place here. Yeah, and I'm not the only person who writes books like that, but it's not the uh, trend these days. There's a very anti-intellectual trend, and in people want to know about emotion, and they don't want to know about fact. I don't want to let you go before talking just briefly. You, The book won the RBC Taylor Prize. And there is no longer an RBC Taylor Prize. Why is that? Well, the person who developed the prize was Noreen Taylor, who who did it as a tribute to her husband, Charles. Fascinating man, uh, a a great thinker, a great journalist. He was the son of E.P. Taylor, who was one of Canada's major industrialists. So there was some money there to work with. Charles passed away, and and Noreen, she wanted to, to mark that. She worked on this for 20 years. So basically, she gave up an awful lot of the most active years of middle age and I'm not going to call her old because she's I don't know how old she is but she's I still think she's younger than me <laughs> I feel like she is she's an incredibly dynamic person she has this gigantic, huge huge group of friends okay I understand that she needs to, she, uh, to move on I understand that but why couldn't the bank just work with her to find someone else to, to, to run it you'll have to ask the bank I, I didn't ask the bank people that I understood from talking with her why she didn't want to do it anymore. That's legitimate. I just wonder why they closed it down. I don't know. Uh, she felt pushed around, I think, in some ways. If you look at this prize, this was the only prize of the three big nonfiction prizes. The GG, uh, the Writers' Trust, and the uh, Charles Taylor Award were the three big nonfiction prizes. And the Governor General's Award and the Writers' Trust Award were almost all memoirs. This is the only prize where the finalists were all researched pieces of nonfiction. Exactly, yeah. We weren't writing about ourselves. Yep. I think there was considerable pressure to make it a prize like the other ones where it was all going to be memoirs. And I don't think that people have all wanted to do that. But that's just my own sort of observance of it. Okay. I think that the trend towards seeing literary nonfiction as only being writing about yourself is wrong, flat out wrong. Uh, it's a disservice to Canadian readers. Uh, it's uh, masturbatory. It shows the uh, narcissism of our times. Um, no, it's, just not, it's just not interesting to read. Well, nobody reads the fucking thing. Yes, exactly. I can't tell you who wrote, who won the DG. I can't tell you who won the Writer's Trust. I know some bloody memoir. Yeah, um, yeah. Really going on about the, the rotten hand they were dealt in life. Well, you know what? Everybody had a shitty childhood. Yes. Everybody got dealt in rotten yeah. hand. <laughs> That's one of life's great big secrets. You know, I, I learned that sitting in court and researching and uh, serial killer files and stuff. And everybody had a crappy childhood. That they could write a story about what a, what a bunch of bastards uh, their parents were, what a shitty place they grew up. Uh, what a rotten head they've been dealt with in terms of their race or their religion or something. But you know what we need to do, Mark? We need to take Radisson's approach and be cheerful about it. Yeah. And I think people should get out and read the book and find out exactly what kind of guy he was. I mean, he wasn't... He he was flawed, but he's fascinating. Well, he's a human being, and that's what I wanted to write about. I wasn't writing about gods or or uh, mythological heroes or anything. I wrote about a real guy, you know, 
we could, you know, if, you, if every fact of our life was put out on the table, you could make a person out to be a monster or a hero, depending on how you wanted to, to look at them. So warts and all, the next guy I'm writing about, you know. Who is it? It's uh, George McCullough, the founder of the Globe and Mail, okay. who has been deliberately written out of Canadian history, and who is a fantastic character. Very good. Yeah. Well, uh, let's hope there's another uh, prize uh, established so you can win that, Mark. Yeah, I'll, I'll be all right. The book is Bush Runner, The Adventures of Pierre Esprit Radisson, and it's published by Biblioasis. Thanks uh, so much, Mark. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.